morning, everyone. Weather. Was a little bit of a hindrance to some today. We're a little bit short. We got about five inches, I think, last night in Fort Smith. Talking to Wayne this morning, and he thinks they got about five and a half out there. And the little town we come through, called Kenta, the water was over the road. Not so much that we had to turn around, but it was high enough that they were there cautioning us to take it slow. I've never seen that in all the years I've been, we've been coming through that town that the water was that high. They said last Sunday, the water was up four feet in the store. So you can imagine a considerable amount of damage not only to the merchandise, but also to the building. The thought for my sermon this morning is more or less in a question. Our, I'm sorry. Start again. The question we want to ask ourselves are we confident in our faith? That seems to be a simple question, but yet it is an important question. Paul, in his writing to the Roman church, he pointed out that there did not seem to be any fear in the hearts of the people. He says, there's no fear of God. If Paul could awaken today and look around him in the world, I wonder if he wouldn't be able to say, even with more conviction, there's just not any fear of God in the lives of the people. I mentioned to you some time back, I was going through my records and came across a letter that a lady wrote to me from the town here. I was emphasizing obedience, and she was scolding me. She said, does it make any difference to God what day we keep. She was emphatic in her pronouncement. Does it make any difference to God what day we keep? If there was any fear of God in her heart, and I'm not trying to judge her remark, it, to me it was quite evident if there's a fear there, we're going to be searching the scriptures to find out what God has to say concerning these subjects. Turn to Proverbs, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> Proverbs, the 10th chapter. The wise man, as he spoke, I do believe concerning our subject today. Proverbs 10 and verse 25. Notice he says, As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. As the whirlwind passes, we see it, but then it disappears. As the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. God is very concerned about our righteousness as we 
conduct our lives in his presence. He's pleased. There's a scripture that says, and I'm not going to thought I could quote it almost per word, but I really can't. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his people or of the saints. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints or his people. They fought a good fight. They resisted. They were concerned about their relationship with the Lord. And so they read and reread, meditated and prayed. Because they wanted to be confident in the faith that they expressed before God. But it just seems today that as long as we're good, obedient citizens, as far as the law of the land is concerned, that we're good Christians. This country supposedly was built upon that principle. But just believing in Christ and being a good, obedient citizen of the country does not make us a Christian. A Christian is one that truly follows the Lord, patterning their life after the life that he lived. Doing the things, not doing the things that he didn't do or that he did. And so we can be confident then in our faith if we know that the way we're living is according to Scripture. I was very surprised, and I think I've mentioned this to you once before. I was very surprised when I visited one of our church members in her home, and she made the remark, she said, Brother Walker, I don't know if I'm going to be saved or not. Think, going through life wondering if you're going to be saved or not. John, when he wrote one of his books, that was one of the things that he encouraged the church. He said that you may know that you have salvation. Rather than we can know, we don't have to go through life wondering. We can know, we can be assured that we please the Lord and thus will gain and receive eternal life in the end. God doesn't want us to go through life questioning whether we will be rewarded for our righteousness in the end time or not. In Matthew the 16th chapter, Matthew the 16th chapter, <clears throat> and the 18th verse, Jesus answered and said unto him, the individual, Blessed art thou, oh, uh, Simon Peter, I guess. Blessed art thou, Simon Arjuna, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now this is our thought. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. The meaning of the word Peter means a little stone. And upon this rock, and the Greek word that the rock is taken from means a massive rock. A massive rock. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As we look at the church of God today, it's getting so small compared to the population of the world. What if it was not for such verses as this? We would wonder perhaps, is the church going to die out? Yes, I agree. 
that it's small. But I can be assured in my mind, I can have the confidence in my faith that I possess that Satan will not be able to completely destroy the church of God. I know that because God said it in his word and God cannot lie. But the question is I've asked myself many times when I read this verse. Not that I question whether the church is going to exist or not, or whether we're West Walker be a part of it when the Lord comes. That's my concern. And it should be my concern that I will still be a part of it. As we look around us and see and view the church of God not too many years ago, we know individuals that attended a church and was faithful in their work and their service to the Lord. But today, they don't darken the door anymore. So that question should be a concern to us. Will Satan be able to discourage us? We all are human. And sometimes people don't treat us like we think we ought to be treated. And so we feel Satan plants that thought in our mind. You going to let them treat you that way? Not too many times in my ministry, but I have seen it. People stop attending church over trifle things. Trifle things. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church because he built his church upon this massive rock. And the question arises, what is the massive rock? The difference of opinion. Some people feel that he is referring to himself. I feel he was referring to his heavenly father. Because Jesus said, even himself said, I can do nothing but that the Father will of him. So he was depending upon his Father that there was nothing he could not do. <clears throat> and we can be assured of that confidence that the church will always exist and we will always exist if we're a part of it faithfully, that is. In Matthew the seventh chapter, <clears throat> Matthew the seventh chapter, beginning with the twenty fourth verse, Christ says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, doeth them, not just know about them, but doeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house up on a rock. The house had a firm, strong foundation, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Brethren, we go through many tests through life. I do believe that God does test us. That we can see ourselves as we are. Do we have that confidence in the faith that we ought to have? If we're easily discouraged. I think we should stop and consider the, the situation seriously whether we're going to allow it to fester and grow. Let us recognize that we all are human. We have that tendency for Satan to tempt us, to discourage us. And what someone might have said, so what someone might have done, we're going to let it discourage us. We're going to let him destroy the foundation that we were 
have been able to build over the years. But then in the 26th verse, <clears throat> And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, will anyone tell you, brethren, that works doesn't matter? Grace without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The two of them must go together. In fact, you cannot have grace without a law that exists for us to obey. <clears throat> the Bible is very clear. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. So there's no need of grace if there's no law. But here the one, he hears, he's received the word, but that in itself does him no good. Unless he puts it into practice, lives it, illustrates it by the life that he lives, because he has read the word and believed. If we live the word, then when open, Oppression comes or discouragement comes, then we'll be able to stand. Paul was very plain when he wrote to Timothy about our thoughts today in 2 Timothy, the second chapter. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, and verse 19. He says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Paul wanted Timothy, as he begins his work in the ministry, to remember the foundation that God has established. <clears throat> nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the God knoweth them that are his. Now this is our thought. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. There is no room for God and iniquity to exist in our life. The two are not compatible. The two will not exist coexist in our life. If we want to serve God, then sin has to go. <clears throat> we have to realize what sin is to depart from it. And to find out what sin is, we have to read. We have to think upon the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the things that God does not like and that he cannot coexist with. Everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. <clears throat> On the other hand, God does not want us to constantly dwell upon the do's and the don'ts. What I'm trying to say is he wants us to serve him with a pure mind, with freedom, without doubt and fear that we might do something wrong. He's given us the understanding to know how to, uh, to live and to conduct our life. <clears throat> but that does not come without some effort. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he says, Study to show thyself the proof unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word. <clears throat> there, some effort has to go in that. The scriptures are not always clear, black and white. Well, most of it is, and it has as to how we're to live 
before the Lord. So much God has not left us in doubt, but so clear, so clear. In my thoughts as I was driving down today, I happened to think of a gentleman when I was pastoring the Tacoma Washington Church. He was not a member of our church, but he wanted the pulpit to speak to the people. I just had my doubts about him and I did not give my consent. Somehow or other we got up on the Sabbath, up the subject of the Sabbath. Whether he knew I just been so long ago, I cannot remember whether I actually mentioned about buying and selling on the Sabbath. <clears throat> Finally he turned to me, he says, Wes, he said, you probably wouldn't even buy a soda pop on Sabbath, would you? In those days, I think it was probably 10 cents. Brethren, it is not the amount of money that we spend on the Sabbath that determines whether it's right or wrong. It's our attitude about the Sabbath. Nehemiah is very clear about buying and selling on the Sabbath. Nehemiah does not mention anything over $50 as sin, but everything under $50 you can do. He doesn't mention that. He simply mentioned about buying and selling. Whether it's small or large. If we think it's all right to buy a can of soda on Sabbath, then you might as well buy a car or, or a house. It would make no difference. It's not the amount of money that God wants us to consider but the holiness of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day that we devote to God in thought and in action. <clears throat> and so Paul is telling Timothy to depart from iniquity. <clears throat> in Psalms, the 37th, the 37th Psalm and the ninth verse. <clears throat> David says, but evildoers shall be cut off. But notice, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Jesus would hear Sermon on the Mount, I believe it was his first sermon. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Nothing is ever mentioned about going to heaven and in inheriting the heaven above. The righteous is going to inherit the earth. Those that wait upon the Lord, if we're confident in our faith, we're going to be patient with the Lord. We believe that there is nothing the Lord cannot do. And I tell you, brother, sometimes the Lord is very slow in answering our request. God is a God that never gets in a hurry. But he's also a God that's never late. And that he will not try us beyond our ability to, to, uh, uh, to carry the burden. For he will not place upon us no burden beyond our ability to carry. But we have to be patient. We have to be patient with him. God is going to see if we believe that he will answer our prayers. Paul was very confident in 2 Timothy, the first chapter. 2 Timothy, the first chapter. And 
and the twelfth verse. Paul says, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, see, he comes to the, to the point here now. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul believed that he was able to keep that which he had committed. What had he committed? His life. He had committed his life. He made a commitment, Lord, I'll serve you. And that is the same commitment that each of us made when we accepted the Lord as our Savior, was baptized to rise to walk in newness of life. We made a commitment, Lord, I'll serve you to the end of my life. And Paul here is expressing the confidence that he possessed. I know whom I have believed. I know. Can you just feel the confidence that radiates from that verse that Paul knows that he had as, as a true relationship? His heavenly Father. <clears throat> but then, I don't know how long it was after this. Paul comes to the conclusion that his life, the length of his life, has come to an end. But he says that doesn't bother me. I'm putting it in my own words. That's not exact words that he spoke. I'm sure it concerned him. Paul was human. He did not want to die needless. <coughs> but he wanted, he made a commitment. And he was willing to keep that commitment to the end of his life. His life was taken from him. I believe Paul was... I believe he was beheaded. Correct me if I'm not, if I'm wrong. <clears throat> but he said, I'm going down to Rome. He did not want those who were weeping for him to try to change his mind from the course that he had set for himself. Because he knew in his mind that God was able to keep that which he had committed. On the other hand, if God did not see fit to preserve his life, he was willing to give it. It's amazing that each one of the apostles, exception of John, he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. But all the others died a martyr's death. We do not know until we're put to the test whether we're that strong or not. I hope you are. I hope I am. But neither, neither of us can answer that question completely until we're put to the test. You know what the scripture tells us? That if we think more of our life than we do of him, we're not worthy of him. Thank God we're not put to that test. The apostles were. I cannot help but feel they were put to the test because they were chosen especially by Christ to be his apostles. And the leaders of the church, the ones who helped Christ establish the new covenant church, 
lost their lives just as Christ lost his. Left us an example. Our confidence should be as strong as theirs. In Daniel, the sixth chapter, you know Daniel was certainly a mighty man of God. He lived a dedicated life. The politics in those days, I somehow get the feeling, it certainly. I'm sure that they felt it was bad for their age, but certainly not near as bad in a mess as the politics are in today. I just cannot imagine a true Christian being able to live. I'm not saying that he couldn't, but it's hard for me to imagine him living a true faithful life today and be a part of our political life. <clears throat> a matter of opinion. But Daniel here, he's living, he's part of the government. He's just one step below the king himself. I get that impression. And there were some who were jealous of his position. And they knew that the only way that they were going to get rid of him was through his service to God. And so they got the king to make a decree that anyone who asked a favor anyone beside him would be put to death. Here in verse verse 10 chapter 6 and verse 10 he says now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem he knelt upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. That didn't stop him. That didn't undermine his confidence, the faith that he had in his Creator. <clears throat> so we know that it can be done, brethren. We know that he can. And those men that accused him, they were watching you read in verse 11. They watched to make sure whether he would continue asking a petition of the Creator. <clears throat> but Daniel never wavered. And whole oh, how wish that we all today would be as bold as so many of our forefathers were so bold and confident in their faith. I'm not speaking about something that we cannot possess. I'm talking about something that can be ours, a reality. It is not Something out there that we just simply strive for every day, but we just cannot quite reach it. No, God never asks us to do anything that we cannot do. That we cannot do. In Acts, the fourth chapter. In Acts, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> The followers in the early church. They were not immune to what others suffered. In the fourth chapter of Acts and the thirteenth verse, 
It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. The word boldness here, I, I think, carries a different connotation attached to it than what we might think today. Being bold is something we normally attach to something that we don't care for. It, it's I wish I could describe what I would like to say. <clears throat> Boldness here means firm firmness. They were firm in what they believed. They were confident in what they believed. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and per perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, <laughs> notice that. Those are just fishermen. They don't know anything. They don't understand the, the ways of God. But then it says, and they took knowledge. They took in consideration that they had been with Jesus. They had spent some time with him. And that should send a message loud and clear to us, brethren. It's good to go to church on Sabbath. We need to go to church. We're admonished to go to church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. Oh, there were some in those days that neglected the church attendance. They were too lazy to get up in the morning. No, I'm, I'm talking about those are healthy and strong now, so don't read something into it. I, I don't intend for you to get. There's been times in my ministry I couldn't help but conclude they were just simply too lazy to get up in the morning on Sabbath morning and get to church. You want to see it begin to creep in the church today, brethren. <laughs> Our larger churches they notice very clearly Sabbath school is neglected. Only a few comes to church in time for Sabbath school. They wait for church. And they can go home, well, I went to church today. Well, I wonder. If their attitude should not be changed some part. We should be in church the entire time. We can get to work at 8 o'clock. How come we can get to church at 10 o'clock? Something is wrong, brethren, somewhere. <clears throat> and so those who wanted to find fault here, <clears throat> they noticed that Peter and John were very firm they were not going to be deviated from their boldness or firmness in standing for the Lord. They noticed that they had spent some time with Jesus. We too need to spend time in His Word, in prayer, in meditation. Our lives, our spiritual lives needs to be fed during the week. Maybe that's the reason why they cannot get to church in time on Sabbath because their spiritual life is so weak. So weak it needs to be nourished during the week. And that can only come by reading and studying the scriptures. My closing text. Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. <laughs> And the, the 32nd verse, the wise man says, the wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. Now, you read this and, and you wonder, are they referring to the death of Christ? No. 
I think they're referring to their own personal death. Remember the words of Job, he says, even though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I'll see God. He had hope in his death. He had hope in his death. And that's what we need in our life when the end comes. That same hope. Death is not the end. The resurrection is going to come and I'll rise with the rest of the saints. We must have that hope, that confidence that we're going to be a part of God's family throughout eternity. May God bless us, my